أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا خاتم النبيين بالقاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين والطاهرين والمعصومين وصاحب المنتجبين وعلى جميع الأنبياء والمرسلين Dear sisters and brothers, assalamu alaikum again. So today we're talking about why are we so unhappy in this world? Anyone has an idea? And what is the secret to, of happiness? Anyone has an idea? Yes. What's the secret of getting happy? Finding a good husband? Inshallah. <laughs> Hopefully. What about for you, yes? Content. Content. How do we get that happiness, that contentness? I'm going to give you the answer, hopefully. Look through the Quran. Allah says in the Quran, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, chapter 59, verse 21. This is a very beautiful ayat. If you guys just keep it on, on your mind how important the topic is based on this ayat. Allah says, لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن على جبل رأيته خاشيا متصدعا من قشية الله وتلك أمثال نضربها للناس لألكم يتفكرون Anyone knows what that means? Allah says in the Quran, and we have sent down this Quran, if we have sent this Quran on top of a mountain, the whole mountain would crumble with humbleness to Allah just because of the awe of Allah. And these are examples that are present for perhaps we may do some thinking. So now, I ask you, where do we find this happiness? First, it's through Allah, of course. Allah is the only one who can give us anything you want. What do you want in life? Happiness. Alhamdulillah. Who's going to give it to you? Not your husband. I mean, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Allah, of course. Now, what has He given us that is such a mercy? Such a blessing. What has he given us? Brother. Uh, good health. Alhamdulillah, but some of us, like me, don't have that great health. So what do you... <laughs> uh, Quran, I guess. Excellent. Yes, brother, you said something? I was just going to say the Quran. Quran, excellent. So Allah says in the Quran again, though, وَقَالَ الرَّسُولُ يَا رَبِّي إِنَّ كُمِّ اتَّخَذُوا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ مَحْجُورًا this is the Prophet talking, but Allah says, The Messenger will say, Lord, my people have abandoned this Qur'an. So now let's go back. Where is the happiness? Of course, through Allah and some of the mercy and blessings He's given us. Why are we unhappy? Because we've abandoned Allah, and we've abandoned the gift that Allah has given us. But Allah says to us that He loves us. Allah says to us, for example, Qatiba Allah nafsihi rahma twice in chapter 6. Verse 12 and 54, he says, I've made upon myself, I've decreed on myself, mercy. And because of the mercy, he's made us. But what is this mercy? What is this love? What is this compassion he has for us? And he says also that this Quran is a mercy to us. It's a shafa and it's mercy. So now we have to say, what are the mercies Allah has given us? Let's figure out why we're sometimes miserable or we're nagging our family or we're just unhappy and where do we find this happiness sometimes we think it's in our desires you want something so bad in your life and you finally get it i don't know what you want the other day i was in the gas station this chinese guy was screaming on the phone because someone hit his i don't know his s350 or 550 or mercedes this black beautiful car just crushed and he's screaming so was that is his material was is going to find his happiness? He looked kind of unhappy. So it's not, that's not where the happiness is. So where is the happiness? First, Allah has given you a mercy of your intellect, your brain, your intelligence. You can see right from wrong. You can see the beauties. You can see the colors. You can appreciate. Tabataba, when he talked about the beginning of Surah Baqarah, he said there's two mercies that we have. One is your, your intelligence, your brain, and then the Quran. It's a mercy, it's a guidance to the muttaqeen. It's something very powerful that Allah says that if it came on a mountain, the mountain would crumble. That's how powerful this book is. What has happened to us? We did a camp for Quran camp. We had over 350 people for the first camp, second camp, say 250, third camp, Quran, barely 100. 
people get scared of Quran. This is Quran. That means we have to read Quran. Yes? Yeah, what's the problem with that? The other day I was with the sister who had a question and she's opening Quran and she was shivering to open the Quran. What has happened to us? This is the gift of God. It's something that's going to save us. But we're scared of it. So another lady, she was, again, <laughs> depressed. Came back from camp and she was so sad. I said, what's the matter? She says, I don't have the, an environment, the Islamic environment, where I live that I had in the camp. I said, but you should be appreciative of what Allah's giving you. She said, ah, I can't. It's terrible. There's not enough Muslims here. No, she was complaining there's not enough Muslims where she lives. Then she went to the beach. She has a beach in front of her house, so she's still complaining. Anyway, she went to the beach, <laughs> and she saw the sun rising. And she sent me an email, and she said this, Allah says, which of the bounties of the Lord have you denied? Look at this surah. 31 times Allah says this ayat. What is he trying to say to us? He says, wake up, aren't you happy what I've given you? All the bounties I've given you? All the blessings? Immediately she became positive. Because she appreciated, she used her brain, she began to appreciate what she has. And it's just a reminder from Quran that Allah is explaining to you all these beautiful things. Another example. Allah says in the Quran, we have revealed the Quran so that you may clarify to people what has been revealed and that they may reflect. Allah sent down so many things in the Quran. Chapter 2, verse 29. People saying, is there creatures in space? Of course there is. It says in the, in the Ayat of Quran, there's uh, living beings in, in space. It's in the Quran. We're going crazy looking for Martians, but it, there's, there's other creations in this universe. It's in the Quran. The Quran talks about the Prophet is another beautiful mercy to us. Who can give me that ayat? Allah says in the Quran that the Prophet is a mercy to all the worlds. Also to the space creatures. Yes. Something Excellent. Excellent. Allah is talking about the Prophet that we have not sent you but as a mercy to all the worlds. So including as living creatures in, in heaven and in, in the earth. Everywhere. The Prophet is a mercy. So now, this Prophet that we have, who is the greatest human being that ever lived on this earth, the most kindest, most eloquent, the most loving of humanity that you can find. He never speaks out of his desires, because that's what chapter 53, verse 3 says. Allah says, never speaks out of his desires. The prophet doesn't do that. So he's come to give us this mercy, this gift of God to us as in, a, in a wrapper with a beautiful bow on it. Some of us don't open it up. We leave it on a shelf and it collects dust. And then we get depressed. We're watching in YouTube, maybe rap battles. I don't know what we're watching these days. I know it's not twerking. I hope not. Anyway, so there's a lot of things that we're getting depressed watching TV. We're getting bombarded by this worldly matter that sometimes like, we're shocked by it. Maybe some of you guys are not, but at least I was. So I'm saying, what's going on? This is a tough world for the youth. I went through tough lives, but me, I think it's getting tougher. Allah says in the Quran, those who listen to the word, then follow the best of it, those are they Allah has guided, and those are those who have, are people of understanding. Chapter 39, verse 18. So I'm talking about all these beautiful ayats of Quran. That Quran will bring us this principle of, of Allah in, in it, in the divine aspect of Allah. He will teach us morality through this Quran, because through morality we'll have happiness. We'll, we won't be oppressing and having injustice in this world. There's a beautiful commercial we, the sister showed me this morning of in Thailand, this young child had to steal medicine to give to his mom and he couldn't afford it. And someone, you know, hopefully, hopefully was kind enough to pay for the medicine. And 30 years later, he repaid back that kindness by being the doctor of the same man that, you know, took care of him. So. What does that show you? That kindness to humanity, is, this is what the Quran teaches us. Loving of each other, caring for each other, sacrificing for each other, standing up for justice. We're surrounded by all these things. At the same time, there's a big danger happening. And this is one of the things I wanted to talk to you about. Anyone saw the lectures by uh, Sayyid Kamal Haidari in Ramadan? In Ramadan, he said something fascinating. He's a big proponent of Quran. He is kind of shocked that the world has abandoned Quran and is a marauder today. 
But he's trying to explain to us through many teachings, the Matabai the same, and Watahri, and all these scholars that have come to show us f to happiness of this world. We are in a world that says, well, I don't care who they are. I want to know what, what does it mean to me? How am I going to be okay? How am I going to survive this world? How am I going to get better? Well, Allah says, what does that mean? Sister in the front, yes. I get mixed up. Alnaz and Nazi and Gulnaz. So what have you, I forgot. You're Gulnaz? Okay, what does that mean? Allah says, God does not change a people until they change themselves. Well, you have to be willing to change. Exactly. Now, why I picked on you is, last year at camp, you were extremely happy because something beautiful happened to you at camp. And you came back this year, and you were so happy. I said, wow, this is, this lady has the recipe of happiness. <laughs> and, and what the recipe was is she awoke to Allah. She realized Allah was there for her, always, never abandoning her, and helped her. And how he helped her is she threw a rock and started skipping in the water. You may think it's not a big deal, but she tried hard and prayed, and it worked. Miracles happen, funny little things, and you'd be shocked. Anyway, that story gives one. There's a guy who was a YouTube is great because I have all these guys who come out and say why they became Muslim. I know that I give you the example of the Australian guy who has a funny story. He opened the Quran and he says, Allah, give me a sign. He opened the Quran and he says, Haven't I given you enough signs? This time I was watching a guy, he was a nightclub owner, and he was a Hindu, and he was selling drugs and drinking and all that stuff in this club in New York. And he says he found a lie, he became Muslim and gave up everything. <laughs> what happened? He lost his club and he said he got depressed. You know how we always get depressed, we lose some money. He lost eight hundred thousand dollars. So he's shocked. And his friend says, You know, I'm looking into Islam. Read this book. He read the Quran and he became Muslim. On top of that, four other people in this club, the three others and him in this club, all living a life of you know, wild sinning, became Muslim. And he said, you know how I became Muslim? I opened the Quran and Allah says, you were in sin, I took you out of that to guide you. Are you going to go back now? He says, wow, well, Allah's talking to me. And he became Muslim and he's so happy about it. There's so many stories like this. Allah talks to you. And he talks to you through Quran. And if you just read this book, you will feel like the goosebumps that, wow, is this, is this really happening? He's affecting my intelligence. I'm asking questions and he's answering me. I have, a, I have a need for some knowledge and he's guiding me. There's a, you know, Malcolm X, in jail, at the lowest point of his life, found Allah. And his grandson, which sadly he died. Um, Malcolm of Shabazz as well, he died. Both of them found the truth of Allah in Islam and they changed the world. They had a powerful effect. There was a guy who was about to be deaconed in New York. His name is Hussein now. He's about to become, just to the level before a priest, and someone gives him the Quran, and fortunately, he, be, he gave up his religion. But fortunately, he found Islam. He read the Quran, the first page, and he says, this is not from mankind. We used to hear these stories about the poets. You know, we always hear about the poets. Unfortunately, maybe we don't understand what they saw. There were examples where the poets would come to Mecca, and they would hear the Prophet reciting the Quran, and they'd become Muslim like that. This is, this is not from man. This is from God. We, when we look at this book, we, we begin to yawn and put it down and say, it's fun, you know, uh, which game do you guys play? Call of Duty. Xbox what? Call of Duty. They still play that? Modern Warfare 3 or 2? Okay. <laughs> anyway, we find other things to do. At the camp, there's one sister, she's from Dearborn, she's here today, but there's another sister from Dearborn. She came to cry in the first year in 2007, and she opened the Quran and she couldn't stop crying until she left 14 days later. I said, what happened to you? She says, I can feel, I can see, I can understand, and before I was blinded. The Quran, even myself, what changed my life? The Quran. What has happened to most Muslims in the world? They go after other things. Maybe they go after the intelligence in school. But in school, there's an agenda by these professors to pr promote atheism, for example, or bash religion. Especially they go after the Christian religion because some of it contradicts science. Well, Islam has been there for us as a guidance. Allah has been there for us to show us the truth. We have this morality, we have this beauty, but then what has happened? 800 years, the Muslims controlled Spain. What happened to them? They lost it. 
They lost the empire. Why? Because the evil ones, they said, we know how to get them. Make them drink. Make them womanize. Make them become, you know, lost. And they did. It's happening to us in America. It's happening to us in Europe. It's happening to us throughout the world. They're going after us by saying, look at Zayn Malik. He's going out with this girl. Why don't you go do the same thing, you know? And you're saying, yeah, why not? And you've seen this lifestyle. He says, I want that. You know what's interesting? Islam is not against a lot of these things. We sometimes put a lot of things in front of us to block us from progressing. So I could talk about you know, the relationships you guys have, in, for example, university. I can talk about it. I have, I'm one person not going to be shy if you tell you the truth. At the same time, you need to do some homework. There's so many things that are going on. Allah says in the Quran, chapter 47, verse 24. Do they not ponder in the Quran? Or is it that their hearts are locked? Our, our hearts become like rocks. You know, this, we can't see, we can't feel, we can't cry when we see a video, for example, of children suffering in the world. Another ayah, verse 83, verse 14. Nay, rather they used to do, has become like rust in our hearts. So our hearts have become hard. We've become just apathetic. You know what apathetic means? We don't care. Those are the hardest people to change when you don't care. And the environment is, you get so tired of religion, for example, coming to the masjid, you're bombarded with the first language you may not understand. You may see funny things that you don't agree with. You say, what is this religion? And then you go and read books. Do we really do these things in Islam? And that most probably we don't. But people are saying we do these things, and I'll give you some examples. What are these dangers that are going on in this material world that's dangerous? And I come to the masjid and I said, we're in ancient history here. What is going on? We're talking like we're dinosaurs. Well, what has happened? And this is where, where I, I give an example, Sayyid Kamal Hidri. He said, in the houses today, in, in, I'm, he kind of attacked. He said, today, if you look at, um, example, what is the houses, like University of Islamic Studies, they are covering, for example, the study of jurisprudence, fit rules, rules upon rules upon rules, and their focus is on studying hadith. Quran is secondary. He, he got so upset. He says, what happened? What happened to the Quran? We made up all these rules and all these things that have come to this religion from outside sources, and he begins to prove it. Let me show you where these outside sources come in. So he begins to show all these verdicts, all these rules, all these examples. It's not Islam. It's made up fairy tales. Some of it is from biblical stories. So for example, is there a stoning in the Quran? Stoning of human beings anywhere in the Quran? Have you ever heard that before in the Quran? Never. But if you open the Bible, it's filled with this talking about stoning. Stone the guy who I don't even want to say, it, but anyways, it's stone this then that guy. Don't follow that path. Now this is an example of why there's so much dangers that are happening. They could not attack you guys through the, your faith, through the Quran. So how do they get you? Through your desires. Okay, he says, well, I'm strong, I can handle myself. And he says, well, if you can't, if you can handle that aspect of life, so if I show you MTV and you're going crazy for those award show, yeah, I got you. But what happens if now I get you through your religion, through your own faith, through the scholars you think are fantastic, are teaching you something of, that the prophets, and the prophet never said this. This is what happened in history. They knew they couldn't touch the Quran. I'll give you an example. One brother came to me and says, you know, I cannot find the Quran written at the time of the Prophet. Yeah, there's one in Turkey. Yeah, there's one in Uzbekistan. But, you know, it's not like that. I says, let me give you an example. In camp, there was a, there was a Quran that they showed to us. It was beautiful. and had red script of every time you see Allah's name. One sister came to us and said, says, brother, you know, there's the word Allah is missing in Surah Rahman. What do you mean? Look, it's missing, missing, missing. How did you know? I know the surah. Again, She knew every Allah. And she says, it's missing. I said, you're right. Most Muslims know the Quran, not necessarily through reading it, through memorizing it. There are 10 million people in the world who memorize the Quran today. At least, if not more. That's what the number they say on maybe Wikipedia, but it's more probably. If you go to the world, during the time of the Prophet, people memorize the Quran. 
Yes, there are like 40 plus scribes. You might only be one of the scribes who wrote the Quran. But you don't need the paper. The, the, the whole 6,000 verses plus 6,000 something has been memorized by humanity. That's how what preserves the Quran. That's the miracle of the Quran. But the hadith, the, the, the stories, the scriptures, the tafsir of the Quran has been manipulated. How did they get us? Anybody has an idea? First, there's a beautiful ayat of Quran, chapter 9, verse 101. Allah says, And from amongst the people of Medina, also there were stubborn and hypocrisy. But you did not know them. We knew them. What is Allah telling the Prophet? You didn't know all the, all the monophics were. Well, you, some of us say, well, I thought the Prophet knew everything. Why did Allah not show some things to the Prophet? There's a reason. If he knew all the monophics are, then maybe you would be a different personality, right? Who knows? So he didn't know some of them. That's what the Quran is saying, chapter 9, verse 101. Now, what do these monophics come to? What is a monophic? A hypocrite. Those guys who are fake, eh, I'm Muslim, but they're behind the back, they're trying to stab you. They're fake. We were surrounded by these type of people during the time of the Prophet. During the time of the Prophet, Hadith, all the Hadith that was written about him, if they were written, because the, according to uh, Ahl al-Sunnah, it wasn't allowed to write the Prophet's Hadith. It was only allowed to write the Qur'an. And even during the time of uh, the first few caliphs, they burned a lot of Hadith. So Hadith became popular during the time of Muawiyah. And when I mention that name, it's, oh, okay, Muawiyah, now I know what we're talking about. Why? Muawiyah had a, a hatred toward Imam Ali. They had a battle, the Battle of Safin. So you can see there was issues popping up in history. One of these people is a guy named Abu Huraira. Abu Huraira was not respected by the first few caliphs. Who is Abu Huraira? Anyone knows? We may not know it as an average Muslim. Who is he? Uh, he's a Muslim. <laughs> story, story. Well, some people say yes. Who said that? Abu Bakr, Umar, and Aisha said Abu Huraira was a Muslim. You're right. They did say that. How, why do we, a lot of Muslims don't like him? It's because he wrote 5,374 hadith. He only lived three years during the time of the Prophet. How did he write so many hadith? And most of that hadith came out during the time of Mahdiya. And some of the hadith, I'll give you an example. And I'm not trying to bash a specific scholar, because I know I had a good friend who became Muslim. And he became Muslim because of the Quran, and they named him Abu Huraira. You know what Huraira means, right? Kitten. The father of a kitten. <laughs> so he liked that name. So I give you examples of some of the hadith he came out with that are weak. Now you may say, why bother? We don't follow it anyway, right? You'd be surprised. We do. It's in all the books. It's began to spread. It's like a disease. When it spreads, it starts to spread fast. So for example, Abu Huraira, one day he writes, he wonders, is that the angel of death who used to come to him visibly? But when he came to Prophet Musa, and to take Prophet Musa, Prophet Musa slapped him. <laughs> so what? The Prophet slapping an angel? I mean, this is a hadith, but anyway. It's not a, it's not a correct one. Then he gouged his eye, and his eyeball was hanging out. And I said, what is this? Anybody who reads this, this is, this is not real, brother. There's something wrong with this. Another hadith. Now these hadith are a little bit extreme, but I just want to show you an example. Another hadith of Abu was saying, there was a competition between Prophet Musa and a rock. Prophet Musa went to take um, a bath in the lake, and the rock stole his clothes and ran away. <laughs> and then Prophet Musa went to run, and hit, well, hit him with a stick. Does anyone have a clue what's going on? I'll give you one more. There's another tradition, Prophet Suleiman had a hundred wives. Then, he's, then he gives another tradition, no, he had 90 wives. No, he had 70 wives, or 60. Contradiction about his hadith. Where do you think these hadith came from? You think the Prophet said this? Of course not. It's illogical. Where did it come from? You know, there's people today who follow these hadith. There's people who follow this way of life. During the time of the Prophet, for example, the Sharia was very small. But today it's a giant, everything is mobile, makru, haram, you know, everything is halal, is good and bad, and every version of it. And it wasn't that hard of a religion during the time of the Prophet. We made it so. Look at the, the thread of these stories, they're all biblical linked. 
they're all linked to Jewish and Christian sources. So, say Kamal Haider was talking about someone that a lot of us probably have not heard. Anyone ever heard of a guy named Kabbal Ahbar? Yeah, you heard of him? Who is he? That's his teacher. Oh my God. Exactly. He's Abu Huraira's teacher. So what does that mean? He gave most of the Hadith, not the Prophet, though Abu Huraira wrote, the Prophet said this, the Prophet said this, but Kabbal Ahbar was a Yemeni rabbi who came to uh, Medina, supposedly became Muslim, but we can tell he's not. Imam Ali said he's a professional liar. He was unfortunately working for Omar. Even Omar's wife, Um Kulthum, said he's a Moroccan. Then he went to work for Muawiyah. This person produced a lot of the hadith that went to Abu Hurairah. And do you know it began to spread? It began to spread not only to, um, you know, for example, the Ahlul Sunnah school of thought, but also to the Falls of Ahlul Bayt. I'll give you examples. First, let me cover, when, anyone gets, can tell me when all the books of hadith really got put together? Say for the Sunni school of thought. 200 years after the Prophet died. Who put it together? You have guys like Bukhari, Muslim, Ahmad bin Hanbal. You know what, exactly, what they did, they began to take three, for example, Muslim took 300,000 hadith, he threw them all away and kept 4,000. What happened to the others? He said they were all lies. Bukhari, 600,000 hadith. He threw them all away, kept 7,275. What happened? Uh, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, 700,000 hadith he got rid of, 40,000 hadith he kept. Even within that, there were lies. Now this hadith began to get spread to Ahlul Bayt school of thought. You may say, how does that happen? First companions, here Abu Huraira quoting something, so they quote it. One problem. Another thing, for 100 years, you know they used to curse, up to the, up to the year 195 or 100 AH, they used to curse Imam Ali. So if your name was Ali, Hassan, Hussein, they would kill you, or your life was in danger. Do you think you can be writing Hadith down? No. So they would actually put a code. They would say the Sheikh said that, meaning Imam Ali. Or they would say, for example, Aulai, uh, Aulai, say this, that meaning Imam Ali, is their lives were in danger. So they couldn't even bring out the truth. Then, this is a shocking thing. In, in uh, the house of today, this is kind of boring, but I want to get you, get, to make you understand what's going on with Islam. Today in the house, everybody looks at the chain of narrations. This is the hadith, but this guy said it, and this guy can get it from this guy, got it from this guy, got it from this guy. You ever play the game telephone or Chinese whispers? Broken telephone. Broken telephone? What does that tell you in the end? Because like you say like, oh, I miss you, and as a people that's what they do. Exactly. The, the hadith, you think it doesn't get caught in this problem? Of course it does. It gets changed. This is the truth. This is reality. The, Allah did not protect hadith. He protected the Quran. Anyway, this, these hadith began to get into the Shia school of thought, into the Ahlul Bayt school of thought. For example, another one. There was a scholar, not a scholar, but this one person, Abu Jafar, would say this hadith and that hadith. Abu Jafar said this. Abu Jafar said this. 400 years later, some scholars say, oh, Abu Jafar said this? Oh, this is Imam Muhammad al-Bakr, Abu Jafar. He said this. He put it in the tafsir. Can you imagine? And you read the tafsir, this is the same from the Israeli sources, meaning Jewish Christian sources. It's not from the Ahlul Bayt. So how do you decipher what's right and wrong now? How do you find the truth? This is the problem that, that has happened. But Allah explains everything in the Quran. Chapter 4, verse 82. Allah said, Do they not ponder the Quran? Had it been from other than Allah, they would have found much discrepancy in it. So Allah is trying to tell you, be careful. If you think that you can protect these hadith and these words, it's going to be tough. We have to try. So for example, there are correct hadith. Of course there is. There is correct way of finding the truth. Of course there is. But the Quran should be our first source. That is our, as the Christians say, that's our Bible. That's the, the main uh, source for us. We've forgotten that. We're scared of that. We're scared to open it. This is the problem we're going through. So, our scholars are discovering all these things that were added to the religion through outside sources. And if you look at it, 
if you talk to non-Muslims, they say, I love your, your view of oneness of God. I know Jesus was a God. He's a prophet. You know, I used to go to Brazil. They used to tell me that all the time. I believe in that. Then you start talking about the rituals, the practices. I don't know if I want to do that yet. I enjoy my way of life. I enjoy my fun. There was a guy I met, even a Buddhist in Peru, and he was saying, I'm Buddhist by faith, but I, I enjoy this drinking and smoking, whatever he was doing. You know, I enjoy these things. This is the problem most people have, because the religion has become so hard on them. This is, I can't become Muslim. You want me to do this, this, and that? I can't handle that. This is a shock that we go through. We think Islam is so rigid, is so strict, that Muslims cannot be open-minded. Of course they can. We've been trying to struggle through this problem. Why I brought this up? For years we've been going through this problem. We've been going through this problem of people misunderstanding the Quran. The one I give an example is, there's an ayat of Quran that has had tafsir that is incorrect about it. The example is chapter 4, verse 3. I've told you about this ayat a hundred times. It bothers me all the time. Because there's people who read this ayat and they leave Islam. You know that? There's a Philippian guy I know. He's a priest. Was Muslim, read this ayat, and I'm not Muslim anymore. Who would do that? Someone who doesn't understand what is written. What the ayat is about, unfortunately, it's mistranslated, that men can beat their wives. That's not in the Quran, brothers and sisters. It's mistranslated. But sometimes you go to the scholars, and he says, look at this, and I'll give you a funny joke. In the camp this year, we had a scholar from Qom. Genius. It was like a spiritual out of Sufi almost, right? And he was explaining this idea. He says, okay, I'm telling you, this injustice here, this is not correct. He says, look, brother, take it as the hadith. The hadith says, you take a toothbrush, and you don't beat your wife, you just touch her with it. And he's British. I said, so you mean like a Harry Potter wand? <laughs> he says, no, it's something very spiritual. I said, this is, tell seven billion people today, this is spiritual, they'll laugh at your face. He says, but this hadith is strong. Alhamdulillah, I sent an email to my brother and he sent me the chain. He says, it's morsel. What does morsel mean? It's a broken chain. It's not a correct hadith. This is examples of our problems that we have. I went and showed him to him that Musawi Lari, who was another great scholar, who said this hadith is not correct. That it doesn't mean to hit. It's impossible. The Prophet Ahlul Bayt would never ask you to do such a thing. They, would ne they never did that. How could Islam say that? There's a lady who for 19 years she's Muslim and she had this question burning in her. She converted to Islam and she found out the truth and now she's so happy. We should not give up on the Quran. Okay, they cannot attack us through the real message of Quran, but maybe mistranslations. And maybe this hadith that's sometimes not correct. But we need to say, where is the truth? How could we decipher the truth? How could we find the truth? How do you start by, how do you fix that problem? You start reading the Quran. So simple. It's the simplest thing we need to do. We says, well, I don't read Arabic very good. So who says you can't read it in Chinese? You can read any language you want. Yes, there's something beautiful about reading in Arabic and, and then the meaning. You can see the connection with God. You can feel it. Because this is the words that Allah revealed. And we should, because we pray in Arabic. We should learn to read. And this is why we have these camps or these programs. So we should learn. But we should know the meaning. We should understand what Allah is saying. Allah says in the Quran, O Prophet, this is an example of how we've gotten this religion into such a tight, scary way of life. Allah says in the Quran, chapter 66, verse 1, Surah Tahrim. Everybody's read this, but now think about it in a different way. Allah says, O Prophet, why do you prohibit what Allah has made lawful in order to please your wives? God is the forgiver, merciful. What is this saying? That Allah is confirming that there is nothing in that, that, that the Prophet would ever do that's they would never say something is haram or forbidden unless Allah told them to do so. So where all this hadith that conflicts with Quran, they say, this is haram, this is haram, it's not in the Quran. Why would we say something is haram that's not in the Quran? These are the examples. And what has happened is we've become so, um, I don't know, how do you say it? Old-fashioned that we follow this way of life. That, oh, the scholars have been saying this for years. It sounds like those guys used to worship idols. Or our forefathers used to worship these idols. So I'm worshiping these idols. Well, we're worshipping the idolatry of lost sciences. You know, we're looking at these, these books and says, wait, where is the truth? Where can we find the correct hadith? Sheikh Mufid, one of the greatest scholars, he, for example, said this book, it's a book called Kitab Salim. 
you say this book is filled with problems. These are the books that are causing killing in the world today. Why? Because you go, you go on the internet, one guy comes on TV and starts bashing another school of thought. And starts quoting haram things that you would never say to your own children. And he says, well, this is the hadith. But this hadith is lost. It's fake. How could you say that? And people are killing, for example, lovers of Ahlul Bayt because of his speeches. This is happening today. At the same time, the scholars, they call them Qur'anis now. They've abandoned hadith. I don't say do that. We should not. We should say Qur'an is our source, and then everything else should fit. Otherwise, throw it away. Right? Throw it against the wall. I forgot his name. His name is Hassan something, but he was on TV in Saudi Arabia. And someone asked him, what do you think of Muawiyah? He's on TV in Saudi Arabia. He says, oh, he's a nar. What's nar? Fire. They said, what? And they got, they got angry at him. He was about to throw him out. This is fascinating. Go on YouTube. And he's become a proponent of going back to Quran. And this is happening now. People are going back to Ahlul Bayt. They're going back to Quran. So we need to find the truth. How did he figure that out? Easily. It's, anyone who goes against the truth, you know, they're in, in risk. It's very simple, it's very logical. Why are Muslims ignorant about it? Because they have this history. Oh, our forefathers lived like this. When, when Imam Mahdi comes to say he's going to change a lot of the things we do, a lot of things we believe, a lot of things we think is the right way of life, it's not. And it's shocking that we still follow this way. We have to be more open-minded now. Is the burden only on us? No. This is where the scholars are coming out and bringing out the truth. It's the beauty. We can't live in a corner in the candle like, I, mean, I swear, I pray this Ramadan, I says, because of this problem of ignorance that we're surrounded with. For example, uh, Sharif Murtada, the brother of Sharif Radi, who wrote Najib Allah, put it together. Sharif Murtada says, we should not follow Khabar Wahid, hadith that's from one source, written, said by one person. We should find what the water, hadith that was by many people, so they say, okay, maybe that's probably true. But now, you know what else happened with the chains? The chains of uh, narrations? They used to sell them. You, see, you, want to, you want to publish a hadith? During the time of Muawiyah and after that, they used to sell. You pick this, this, this guy, pay me some dirhams. They used to sell the chains. So, Kamal Haider said, you know what? Forget the chains. What is the content? What is the mutton? What is the meaning? That's what you should look at. If there's something wrong there, you say, wait a second. Let's start questioning things. So when I go mention this ayat, why would we make things haram for ourselves? And why would we make this religion so hard for ourselves? It's not. For example, there's some scholars, we heard about the, the Marathas in Lebanon, who came out with these rules, and a lot of people said, wait, wait a second, he's, he's becoming too liberal. Well, he's finding the truth. Even in Iran today, there's a lot of scholars finding the truth. There are scholars who are doing their homework, and they're finding the truth for us. Now, we are quickly to bash. No, we shouldn't. We don't bash, but we want to find the truth. Now, this is what Sayyid Kamal said in his lectures in Ramadan, and I was so happy because our prayers were answered, meaning, there are scholars going out. No one's perfect. Okay, he's coming out with his research. All the Hadith writers, they tried their best, but this, they're not perfect. All the scholars, for example, Kulain, who was alive during the Gebet al Sugra, put together which book? Which one? Kafi, example. One of the strongest books that we use in our school of thought. Even that book is filled with weak Hadith. The scholars will tell you, you can't find it. It's not the Quran. Only the Quran is the Quran, meaning there's no mistakes. Allah's protecting the Quran. He's not protecting everything else. So where do we find the answers now? Now this is the beauty. He says, well, Quran, but what if I don't understand the Quran? Anyone has an idea? Do we go after Hadith only? No, because that could be problematic. Allah says in Quran, chapter 77, verse 15, which Hadith other than the Quran do you uphold? This is Allah saying this in the Quran. Chapter 45, verse 6. Allah says, There are God's revelations that we recite to you truthfully. In which hadith, other than God, is revelations do you believe? This, Allah is using the word hadith. Hadith meaning narrations. The sayings of the prophets, for example. Chapter 31, verse 6. Allah says, Amongst the people, there are those who upheld baseless hadith. Is Allah saying this? He's forewarning us. Look at the dangers that are coming. Look at the problems that are coming. Now, where do we find the truth? It all goes to what the brother just read. If you pay attention to what he said, one of the ayats he read in the beginning was, Fas alu ahla dhikr in kuntum la ta'lamun. What does that mean? 
Yes. Ask the people of Dikr. Ahl Dikr. Who are Ahl Dikr. Okay, you say it's Ahl Bay. If you don't know. So, in Kutub la Ta'alam. If you don't know, ask those of Ahl Dikr. People of remembrance of God. People who know God. Who are given the message. So, he said, but who are these people? One time I was in Jummah prayers in Ahl Sunnah and he said something beautiful. He says, how do you know how to make bread in Quran? Bread. He gave this ayah. If you don't know, ask those who know. <laughs> it's a good answer. I said, here, this guy's smart. <laughs> it's good. This ayah is repeated again. Chapter 16, verse 43. Again, chapter 21, verse 7, which you said. So ask those, Ahlul Dhikr, people of remembering God, if you don't know. So Allah's telling you, if you don't know, if you don't understand what's happening, what the Quran is about, ask those who know. Okay. Let's go further. Who is Ahlul Dhikr? Actually, I'm glad Muhammad is here because I asked this same question to you two years ago. Let's see if you remember. Allah says in Surah Waqiyah, verse 75 to 79, Allah swears, but nay, I swear by the falling stars. And most surely it is a great oath if you only knew. Allah swearing by the falling stars. This, this is a big promise. That most surely this is an honored Quran. In a book that is protected, Allah is protecting it, none shall touch it but the purified ones. What was the ayat in Arabic? Do you remember? <laughs> Excellent. Beautiful. You remembered. <laughs> Who are the mutahharun? None shall touch it but the purified ones. Who are the purified ones? Who? Muslims? I wish. I would love that. I know. Maybe when you do wudu. Maybe. You go to the bathroom and wash yourself? Hopefully. No. Who are the purified ones, sister? You catch the one sleeping in the back. Ahl bayt Ahl bayt are the purified. How do you know? Because Brother Muhammad said so? No. Yes. Give me the ayat. Ayat built up here. Give it to me. Give me the number. 33, verse 33. Chapter 30, verse 3. Yes? Inama you read Allah liyud have ankuma ritsa, which is unclean. Remove from you the uncleanness. Ahlul bayt, remove the uncleanliness. Allah wills to remove all blemishes and uncleanliness from Ahlul bayt and purify you with a perfect purification. Salawat. Allah. Look at that beauty. Allah saying, none shall touch the Quran except the purified ones. Then Allah says, who are the purified ones? Ahlul Bayt. Now some people say, well, Ahlul Bayt are the wives of the Prophet. We will say, well, is the word Ahlul Bayt feminine or masculine? Who knows Arabic? It's actually masculine. I don't know how to say it in feminine, you know? Anyway, like you put it like a noon in there or a tie in there. Okay. So the word is masculine. Actually, it's written and everybody knows and all the scholars know this side is about Ahlul Bayt of the Prophet. Fatima, Ali, Hassan, Hussein, and all the Ahlul Bayt, we call them the 12 Imams. So Allah is saying, you want to know the Quran? Ask them. Well, how do you find that now? How did the Ahlul Bayt teach us how to understand the Quran? This is the beautiful thing. And we're going to talk about this, not today, but the next few weeks. How do we know how to understand Quran? How did Ahlul Bayt give us the answers how to understand Quran? Through the Quran. They explain things. I gave you, for example, Ahlul Dhikr, the purified, who are the purified, Ahlul Bayt. I showed you from the Quran who are the people. All the answers are in the Quran. Allah gave us the perfect book. He gave us the guidance, the mercy, the blessings that could crumble mountains. I mean, it gives you guidance even in your businesses. It gives you guidance in your, where you should live, where you should walk. People do a staccato to find the truth. I'm telling you, this is the answers. Now you may say, what is this Quran? I'm still uncomfortable with it. I'm still not happy with it. Look what Allah says in Ramadan. We just finished Ramadan a couple of months ago. Allah says, Shahr Ramadan, Alladhi unzila fihi al-Quran, hudan min nas, wa bayinat, min huda wa furqan. Allah says, in the month of Ramadan, we reveal this Quran. A guidance to people. Clear proof of guidance and distinction. Now, the Quran is so incredible. You may say, I still don't get it. You have to, you know, you can say to some non-Muslims, explain to them Islam, you know they never, never become Muslim? If you tell them intellectually, you, you, 
Look, no, give them a brain explosion of nuclear knowledge. They still won't become Muslim. They have to feel that experience. They need to be touched. They say, touched by an angel. We say, no, touched by Allah, the mercy of God. You, you have to feel inspired. And this is what the Quran does to people. People just open this and they just get inspired. And this is the scary thing. By people get scared. They said, we thought we can you know, hide the truth. You can't. It's out there. So, for example, chapter 63, verse 4, something amazing happening in the camp. Is, um, is Brother Hussein Jassim here? No, right? Okay. He came to the camp. He's visually impaired. He cannot see. We memorized. Everybody had to memorize different surahs. You guys missed the Quran camp. But anyway, he had to memorize Surah Munafikun. And he says, beautiful. I love this. And he loved it. It was like amazing. He can memorize like that. He can't even see, but he would read with Braille. See, they kind of they hide the truth, but they can't. It's there. So we're talking to him, and I want to see who knows his ayat. So we get to his, his read, memorize the first three verses of Surah Munaf. He gets to fourth, and the ayat is, and when you see them, their persons will please you. And Allah's talking about the Munafiks. And I'm with him, we're trying to memorize this together, and he felt, I can see, he felt sad for a second. Because why? He says, when you see them, he says, well, I can't see them. What does Allah say? The next sentence. And if you, if they speak, you will listen to their speech. He says, oh, I can hear their speech. <laughs> and he says, look at that. He felt, I, he, this is what he said, I felt Allah talk to me. And it's funny, I was reading Surah, I don't know if you guys knew, but I broke my leg in the camp. Unfortunately, I'm getting old. I jumped, I landed, and landed wrong. I'm reading Surah Fat. It says, there's no blame on the blind and the lame. I'm the lame. I was lame. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I was like, wow, this is a blessed book. Who can give me the eye of chapter 4? The eye of Surah Maravigun, chapter 60, verse 4. Anyone knows it? Come on, you guys should know Quran. <laughs> well, give me 20 bucks. And everybody opens their app. <laughs> okay. Let's hold on to this mercy that Allah has given us and understand this Qur'an. Let's live it. And when I say live it, this is something very important. There's people going out burning Qur'ans today. Why? Because they know it affects us. It bothers us. And people get killed because of a book being burned. I don't say that's a good thing for anybody to do. It's ignorance that they're burning the Qur'an, but at the end of the day, it is paper. We don't worship paper. We don't worship this book. We worship the creator of this book. The one who said the words, Allah, of course. Examples of this in history has happened. Going, going back to Muawiyah, who fought Imam Ali in the battle, and the hadith of the Prophet was, whoever kills Ammar bin Yasser is of the, the evil ones. And Muawiyah killed Ammar bin Yasser. Anyway, so Muawiyah is fighting Imam Ali, and Imam Ali's army is defeating Muawiyah's army. They're about to lose. What do they do? They put, I think, like 500 Qurans on a spear, and they lift it up. Hey, we have to stop fighting. Everybody says, Quran, oh my God, let's stop fighting. Imam Ali says, come on, let's keep fighting. They're about to lose. This is the struggle of the truth. Imam Ali was the one living the Quran, but they didn't listen to him. And this is why we have a lot of the problems of Hadith today. This is a lot of problem. We have a lot of problems in this faith because we can't find the truth clearly, but it's there. Alhamdulillah, there's two billion Muslims, and the world will be seven million very soon. You may say, well, brother, you're being pushy. I'm not. It's the truth. And that's the quote in the camp. If people want the truth, they're going to find it. If people discover the kindness of the beauty of this religion, like, for example, uh, the movie director's son or the, the prime minister's sister. I mean, people are becoming Muslims. They're not even telling you. They're scared to say it because they know their lives are in danger. We should live the words of Allah. We should live in kindness. And you will see this world be filled with peace and justice. Salawat. I don't know how much time you have, but I think we should allow some questions, answers, and comments, right? How much time do you have? Yeah, we're actually going to have to take a short intermission and have refreshments. Oh, nice. And then we're going to do an end. Okay. So everybody can gather their thoughts and uh, if you have any questions, write them down. We'll send out paper in a moment. Okay? Well, maybe about 10 minutes. Huh? Or hands up, it doesn't matter. Whatever's cooking.